reading through the Bible in a year. March 16th, Exodus 27, John chapter 6, Proverbs 3, and Galatians chapter 2. You shall make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make horns for it on its four corners, and its horns shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. If you look in the image here, the horns are the little pokey bits up at top. You shall make pots for it to receive its ashes, and shovels, and basins, and forks, and firepans. You shall make all its utensils of bronze. You shall also make for it a grating, a network of bronze, and on the net you shall make four bronze rings at its four corners. And you shall set it under the uh, ledge of the altar, so that the net extends halfway down the altar. And you shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. And the poles shall be put through the rings, so that the poles are on the two sides of the altar when it is carried. You shall make it hollow with boards. As it has been shown to you on the mountain, so shall it be made. You shall make the court of the tabernacle. On the south side of the court you shall have hangings of fine twined linen, a cu- rather, <clears throat> on the south side of the court shall have hangings of fine twined linen a hundred cubits long for one side. Its twenty pillars and their twenty bases shall be of bronze, but the uh, hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. Likewise, for its length on the north side, there shall be hangings a hundred cubits long, its pillars twenty and their bases twenty, of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. And for the breadth of the court on the west side, there shall be hangings of fifty cubits, with ten pillars and ten bases. The breadth of the court on the uh, front to the east shall be fifty cubits, and the hangings for the one side of the gate shall be fifteen cubits, with their three pillars and three bases. On the other side of the hanging shall be fifteen cubits, with their three pillars and three bases. For the gate of the court there shall be a screen twenty cubits long of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen, embroidered with needlework. And it shall have four pillars, and with them four bases. All the pillars around the court shall be uh, filleted with silver. Their hooks shall be of silver, and their bases of bronze. The length of the court shall be a hundred cubits. The breadth, fifty. And the height, five cubits. With hangings of fine twine linen and bases of bronze. All the utensils of the tabernacle for every use and all its pegs and all the pegs of the court shall be of bronze. You shall keep, rather, you shall command the people of Israel that they bring you pure, beaten olive oil for the light, that a lamp may regularly be set up to burn. In the tent of meeting outside the veil that is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall tend to it from evening to morning before Yahweh. It shall be a statute forever to be observed throughout their generations by the people of Israel. Moving on now to John chapter 6. Probably one of my favorite chapters in the entirety of the Bible. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing and uh, doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. And lifting up his eyes then, seeing that a large crowd was coming toward Jesus, he said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. Again, that's 200 days wages. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Well, there, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And Jesus said, Have the people sit down. 
Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about five thousand in number. Jesus then took up the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to all those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered, uh, rather, they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with the, uh, with the fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw this sign that he had done, they said, this, this indeed is the prophet who was to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to take and make him king by force, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started uh, across the sea to Capernaum. This was, or it was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. And when they were, rather, then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. The other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So, when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Is there a note on this section? Firmly there is. Not really. Anyway, there's other things you can read in this. No, we'll read the note out of the Reformation Study Bible. This is a good one. So, although they saw the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, they did not recognize it as a sign identifying Jesus as the kind of Messiah that the Father had sent him to be. It was merely an op- as an opportunity for a meal for them, or to them. Their immediate reaction, acclaiming him as the promised prophet and eager to embrace him as a political military king, we talked about this before, was short-lived, as Jesus knew it would be. Back to the text, verse 24. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. This is a recurring theme through what we're going to be reading through the next, really the next few chapters, but we're really going to focus on it here. A good way to put this is that um, as we, if this is your first time through the Bible, um, you'll see this occurring as we read mostly the prophets, when we get to uh, both sets of prophets, the major and the minor, that there's a recurring theme that the prophets will receive a scroll from God, and they will eat it, and when they eat that scroll, um, It'll be sweet in their mouth when they eat it, but in their stomach it becomes bitter, something that they must get out of them. In the same way, basically what it is is that they've eaten the scroll, it's become part of them, and now they have to tell people about it. That's kind of the point being made. Like if you eat um, just a bunch of just, you know, raw habaneros, um, you want to get it out of you as soon as possible, it's not like that. This is just something that um, once, it, once it's been eaten and consumed to become part of them as a person, they can't help but do those things. And here Jesus talks repeatedly about him being food. And they're going to get real confused on this. Again, lots of notes in this area. Strongly recommend that you read them. Jesus is not preaching cannibalism as the people believe him to be preaching. But he's preaching that his teachings, that the essence of who he is, and Jesus' letter refers to this again when he says that he is, sorry, that he and the Father are one, and if you would have recognized 
Uh, if you want to know the Father, you should only look to Jesus. In the same type of way, um, what we're seeing here is that Jesus' teachings, we must bring into ourselves, make part of ourselves, the same way that you would eat bread. That you eat it, and it becomes part of your body. That's why he refers to his teachings as food. Remember that as we go forward, this does get confusing to many people. Back to verse 27. Do not work for the food that perishes, again, bread and fish, but for the food that endures to eternal life, the teachings of Christ, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father has set his seal. Is there a note on the seal bit? Um, a little bit here. Uh, let me read from the ESV study Bible. A seal made of wax, clay, or various kinds of soft metal would signify either ownership or, authentic or authentication of an item or a document. The second sense is probably in view here, that God has set his seal of authenticity, of truthfulness upon Jesus the Christ. Verse 28, And they said to him, what, what must we do to be doing the works of God? So Jesus answered them, Well, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Well, then what sign do you do that we may believe or see and believe you? What work do you perform? I mean, other than feeding them? Other than healing people? Other than raising people from the dead? Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. Talking about manna. But my father gives you the true bread from heaven. See, he's doing that thing again where he's, he's talking vertically and they're thinking horizontally. So he's bringing them back to the spiritual nature of what's being done. They only see the earthly thing. They're like, do some sort of magic trick and we'll believe you. And he keeps going back to this food analogy because it's a good analogy for what's happening. Continuing on. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I already said that, uh, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Again, we can see this now because we know that he is the Christ. These people didn't understand it then. They thought he was just a guy who was born in Galilee or raised in Nazareth. They don't know that he is the Christ of God. But Jesus is telling, and his disciples saw this, and they're starting to put things together. But what's happening here is that they're, uh, sorry, Jesus is telling them the truth directly in as plain of a way as he can tell them, and they're not getting it. Again, it makes more sense to us when you read through it and you think that the bread that he's talking about or the thing that he says you must eat is the teaching of that which he is, has been saying this whole time. Continuing on. Back to verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Again, if you read it with that context, it makes sense. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. He's talking about those who are um, the elect of God, right? Those that the Father has elected for salvation. We all talked about this also in um, uh, John chapter 3. All that the Father has given me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So, of the entire set of everybody in the universe, right? Not really on this planet, but you get my point. Uh, people in all time, those who are chosen by the Father are given to the Son, and they will, by nature, come to Jesus, right? Because they have been elected by God, and they have been predestined to receive his teaching, Verse 38, for I have, uh, doo -doo -doo. yeah, whoever the, um, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. 
And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews, capital J Jews, remember you see this and you can think this is the ruling class of the Jews. They grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. He's referring to the manna, which sustained the people in in the same way as the manna sustained the people and uh, met all of their needs that they had in the wilderness. Jesus is saying that his teaching does the same thing for us today. So they grumbled about this. And they said, is not this Jesus, son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, again meaning, this is most certainly true. I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. That's now the third time he said this. I am the bread of life. He's getting real direct here. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they did. They all died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. Again, he's talking about his teaching. They're not following. Why? Because they're not of the elect. So he dials it up some more. Verse 51, I am the, bre- sorry, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. And if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now he's talking about the fact that he is going to physically die in our place. He's not talking about um, communion because that has yet to occur. He's talking about his teaching and the fact that he will be sacrificing himself for us. This is where they get real weirded out. Then the Jews disputed amongst themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. I'm going to read the note out of the Reformation Study Bible about this whole section, 51 through 58. And then I'm also going to read the note specifically on this section out of the ESV Study Bible. Let's begin. Jesus here has continued to misunderstand his statements, taking them on a purely horizontal physical level. Understood literally, what Jesus says is highly objectionable since it would involve cannibalism and a use of blood that is strictly forbidden in the law. Tons of references there. We'll get to those later. Jesus uses the language of eating and drinking to illustrate the intimacy of the union between Christ and the believer. Hear what I said at the beginning. Eating the scroll becomes part of you and then you have to go get it out and tell people. Same thing here. The spiritual union, which rather by which Christ imparts new life to the believer, is portrayed later in the gospel as the union of a vine and its branches that physically become the same thing. It is sometimes called the mystical union. It is a recurrent topic in Paul's letters, uh, Galatians 2.20 and Ephesians 1, 3 through 3-14. Though some see here a reference to the Lord's Supper, as I mentioned a second ago, a mention of that sacrament at this point would have been incomprehensible to Jesus' listeners. This passage is best understood against the backdrop of Passover, which is what they're in, and its symbolism. As pointing to the spiritual reality that the Lord's Supper also signifies, 
union with Christ and all the benefits of salvation received through him. Now to the note specifically on this, eat my flesh, drink my blood, from the ESV Study Bible. The term, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, cannot be intended literally. For no one ever did that. As Jesus has done frequently in this gospel, he is speaking to them in terms of physical items in this world to teach them about spiritual realities. Horizontal, vertical. Here, to eat Jesus' flesh and the spiritual meaning of trust, sorry, has the spiritual meaning of trusting or believing in him. Especially in his death for the sins of mankind. See also verse 35, where Jesus speaks of coming to him as satisfying hunger, and believing him in, in him as satisfying thirst. Similarly, to drink his blood means to trust in his atoning death, which is represented by the shedding of his blood. Now, before I go any further, although um, it, would be, it wouldn't make any sense for Jesus to now talk about the Lord's Supper, which is to come, he at this point begins telling his disciples of the fact that he must suffer and die at the hands of the Jews for the sins of the people. So, this is not incomprehensible for him to talk about these things at this time. In fact, any good student of Scripture would have already recognized that the suffering um, Savior, the suffering servant, must be punished for the sins of the people, for the sins of the elect. So they would have already made these relationships ahead of time. Back to the notes. Although Jesus is not speaking specifically about the Lord's Supper here, there is a parallel theme that you can kind of follow. Because the receiving of eternal life through being united with the Son of Man is represented in the Lord's Supper, where Jesus' followers symbolically eat his flesh and drink his blood. This is anticipated in Old Testament feasts. This is also referenced in 1 Corinthians uh, chapters 5-7. through 7. It is consummated in the marriage supper of the Lamb, which we read about later in Revelation chapter 19, verse 9. Back to the text, verse 54. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my, fle my, my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread that fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread, his teachings, what's going to occur later as he dies in the place of the people. Whoever feeds on that bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, now remember, disciples, these are all of the throng of people who are following him. This is not the people who are apostles. But these followers heard it. They said, this, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, he said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? They will. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who were, rather, yeah, who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, see the difference between the people? Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. 
and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. They've already made that correlation. They know that he is Christ. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. That's all the notes to hear. Move on to Proverbs chapter 3. Wow, I did that one 20 minutes. A little over, not bad. I'm happy with that. Let's go. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life, and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor Yahweh with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise Yahweh's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for Yahweh reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son, in whom he delights. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. Yahweh, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open, and the clouds dropped down the dew. My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion and they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Then you will walk on your way securely, and let your, f- rather, and your foot will not stumble. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be a sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes, for Yahweh will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, "Uh, Go and come again tomorrow, and I will give it. You have it with you. Do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. Do not contend with a man for no reason, when he has done you no harm. Do not envy a man of violence, and do not choose any of his ways. The devious person is an abomination to Yahweh, but the upright are in his confidence. Yahweh's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. The wise will inherit honor, but fools get disgrace. Let's conclude today in Galatians chapter 2. Paul continues. Then, after fourteen years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Because of false brothers secretly brought in, 
who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, that's into slavery, back under the slavery of the law. To them, we did not yield in submission, even for a moment, so that the truth of gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, they were, makes no difference to me, God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, meaning the Gentiles, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, the Jews, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised, Jews, also worked through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas, Peter, and J Cephas is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, received the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and to me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised, the Jews. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing that I was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him, this pillar of the, the church, to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when uh, they came, these Jews came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy, but when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live as a Gentile and not a Jew, how can you force these Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth, and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one is justified. Again, we already read through this in Romans. We went through it in depth in understanding what that meant. Verse 17, but if in our endeavor to, uh, to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. I'm going to read the note on this here because this is super important. There are a ton of notes that I recommend that you pause and read through here. I'm going to go ahead and pull it up so you can see them all. Here we go. Um, let's read from the Reformation Study Bible. So, tore down. The Greek word translated tore down is used in the New Testament to mean the tearing down of an edifice. We see it in Mark, or rather in Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and Romans 14.20. Paul may be thinking here of efforts to keep God's commands in order to merit justification from him, or perhaps the maintenance of regulations that mark the boundary between law-abiding Jewish insiders and lawless Gentiles outside. Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. To rebuild the wall of the law, in this sense, is to bring again, or rather bring in again, the condemnation of the law. The lawbreaker is not the one who turns from the law to Christ for justification. It is the one who turns back again from Christ to the law for his justification. If you are a Christian, but you believe that you must, um, if, if you believe in Christ, you know that he is the one who died for you, you uh, understand that you are wholly destitute, that you never could have saved yourself by the works of the law, but yet you today hold yourself to the sabbatical laws, or you uh, refuse to eat um, uh, things that the Old Testament calls unclean, or you um, 
uh, you, you keep um, as many of the, the mosaic laws as you possibly can in order to justify yourself before God, to, to be a good person, to make it back up to God for saving you, or if to um, you know, make yourself worthy before him, you have missed the plot. You cannot do it. You cannot save yourself through obedience to the law, and you cannot maintain your salvation through trying to keep the law. We are saved by Christ despite ourselves and our inability to keep the law. We're saved by his work on our behalf. And it is he who sustains us. We don't hold ourselves within this Christian union to Christ. It is he who holds on to us. Because if it were up to us for even a split second, we would instantly fail. Back to the text. Verse 19. For though I, rather, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. Remember, the law only brings condemnation. It is a signpost that says, you must be this perfect, this holy, in order to enter into my rest, says God. And we fail every step of the way. It's like it says, and I think it's James 2.19, I could be totally wrong, but it says that if we fail in one part of the law, we fail in all of it. So how then should we trust in the law to maintain our salvation? We couldn't do it beforehand. We're trusting in the finished work of Christ. This is why it's foolishness to people. Jews and Gentiles together think that Christianity is stupid because we're not trying to maintain it through being good people. This is why they hate it so much. Everything else, it's easy. You got to go to mass. You got to keep all the uh, all of these specific laws. You got to uh, you know tell your sins to a guy in a box, and he goes to his guy, and he goes to his guy, and he talks to God and tells you, you know, oh well, you must you know self-flagellate or whatever it is you have to do to to punish yourself and say a bunch of prayers over and over, just repeating the same prayer for some reason to to absolve yourself of the sins. Maybe you have to obey all of the pillars of Islam. Maybe you have to uh, reject yourself so much that you reject everything about you, uh, about, about your humanity. You reject all uh, trappings of wealth, of anything in this life, and you live naked on the streets. You don't even ask for food. You just eat what happens to fall off of trucks, or what you find in the trash. All of these things are things you must do to maintain your salvation, or whatever that might mean. But Christianity says Jesus has already done it on your behalf, and all we do now is we live in faith of what he's completed. Back to verse 19 again. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If the law could save you, then let the law save you, and Jesus never would have had to die. Again, remember the people that he's talking to here and what they're enduring. All right, that's all for today. That's all the reading and all of the notes. God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.